All right, welcome back. Today we're following up on our first video on home lab projects with five more projects for you to give a try in your home lab. And if you're new here, hi, this is Sonoran Tech where we cover a wide range of tech topics from hardware to home labs to coding and current events. If you like the content, hit the sub button and leave a comment to let me know what topics you're interested in seeing. So let's jump right in. All right, idea number one is to self-host machine learning models. Maybe you've played with ChatGPT or Claude, but didn't like the idea of giving your data to cloud providers. Well, using Olama, you can self-host models in your home lab and keep your data completely private. Installing Olama is as simple as downloading and installing the toolset from their website and then using the command line interface to install and run a model. It is amazingly simple. As you can see with just a curl command in Linux, it'll get everything installed and then you can install all the models you want. They're obviously a bit larger on the downloads and you're off and running. You can select from a variety of models to try out, including some of the latest models such as Meta's 450 billion parameter, Llama 3.1 model, and Google's Gemma model. Now, the default Olama command line interface only goes so far, but using tools such as Open Web UI, you can build an entire ChatGPT replacement running locally in your home lab while being completely private, and you can make it accessible to your entire household without giving your query data to OpenAI or whoever else you don't wanna give your query data to. Idea number two, and this kind of follows right on the Olama idea. Since we're on the topic of machine learning models, GPUs are kind of an important part of the machine learning space. And since the two go hand in hand, our second idea for today is to go ahead and write some CUDA code to understand a little bit about how these applications are developed to leverage GPUs. So if you're not familiar with it, CUDA is a parallel computing platform and programming model created by NVIDIA. It allows you to leverage the power of NVIDIA GPUs or other GPUs, making it ideal for tasks that require heavy computation. And setting up the CUDA toolkit and program programming environment is really straightforward on a variety of platforms. And for this idea, I'd recommend starting with just a simple hello world style program that is kind of tuned to uh, the strengths of GPUs. And one example would be doing vector addition. So writing a vector addition program with CUDA is very straightforward. And there's plenty of other tu tutorials out there, videos, uh, tutorial walkthroughs on the web to show how to write it. And believe it or not, you could just ask ChatGPT to write the code for you as well. So you can write this uh, parallel vector addition program in CUDA, then write the same program in C or C++ and compare the two side by side. And what you can do is you can start to scale up the data set you're adding, like scale up the vector size to be very big and really see kind of the power of the GPU environment and how doing these calculations in parallel is very helpful. All right, idea number three, run your own Kubernetes cluster. So Kubernetes is an orchestration tool used to manage containerized applications. So setting up a, a Kubernetes cluster in your home lab can teach you a lot about containerization, networking, automation, etc. It may seem like a bit of an overkill for a home lab environment, but again, this is all about learning and playing with tools that are commonly used in the industry. But you may wonder, like, what's it going to do for you in your home lab environment other than just setting up a whole bunch of, of machines to do something? Well, if you're running any containerized application, such as maybe a dashboard like Homar or one of the others, you do have a single point of failure. If the host running that container goes down, you're out of luck, you don't have a dashboard. Something like Kubernetes can solve this for you by making these containers highly available and running across multiple machines within your home lab environment. Again, it may seem like a bit of an overkill for a home lab, but setting it up is pretty straightforward if you use the right tools. I'll come back to that. But it'll enable you, if you get it set up, you'll be able to take machines in and out of service and you know try out other projects without interrupting some of the key services that you are running in your home lab. Kubernetes has a reputation of being pretty difficult to set up and in production environments, this is certainly true, but there are many um, distributions and tools to make this much simpler in a home lab environment. And two examples of this are K3S or Micro K8S. And so both of these allow you to get a simple setup up and running very quickly and I was I played with both of them and in particular um, micro KDS I was able to get a kubernetes cluster running in just a couple minutes because it makes a whole bunch of assumptions about your environment it runs a whole bunch of capabilities on the same node it just makes it super simple to get going quickly and play with it and that's the whole point so there you go idea number three is to try out kubernetes in your home lab moving on to idea number four 
and that is switching to Linux as your primary operating system. So in a recent video, I talked about trying different uh, Linux distributions. And when I showed this, I was suggesting using virtual machines to do it. Here I'm saying, hey, pick a distribution and go all in. Pave over a machine or dual boot, whatever works for you, but take the plunge and try running it as your daily driver. See how much of your daily workloads transfer over and see if you enjoy the experience. Even if it isn't something you stick with in the long run, you'll learn a ton about Linux. You'll learn about the Linux world, the tool chain. You'll learn a new set of applications. And honestly, you'll probably face a new set of issues to work through. And in working through those issues, you'll learn a thing or two. And it's definitely worth it. Now, switching to Linux is currently a hot topic in the YouTube sphere. And I even did, did a video about this regularly. And so that may be annoying to hear this idea yet again. Oh my gosh, it's the 30 day Linux challenge. But look, one positive about all this is right now, there is tons of great content out there to help you out with your installation, understanding what distribution to pick, what apps to use, etc. And really there hasn't been a better time to give this a try. If you look at the last video I did where I said I was using Ubuntu as my daily driver, there are endless comments about different viewpoints on which distribution you should run as a daily driver and run full time. So people love Linux Mint or Pop OS or Arch. And that's my point. There's a lot of kind of interest in this topic right now. So it is a good time to give it a try. And our final idea, number five, is to build a Ceph storage cluster but I'm gonna say build a Ceph storage cluster using Proxmox. Now there are many NAS slash storage solutions out there you can run in your home lab, but I find Ceph particularly interesting because it's a storage service designed for very high scale environments. Arguably few would ever need the capabilities of Ceph in a home lab situation, but that's what makes it fun to experiment with. Now setting up a bare Ceph cluster can be a little confusing and you have to dig through a ton of documentation to do it. So you may wanna look for some tools that automate uh, some of this for you, similar to the Kubernetes approach. Again, you can pick K3S or one of the others. One way to do this with Proxmox is to, sorry, one way to do this for Ceph is to use Proxmox. Since Ceph can set up and run this, I keep mixing up the words, but Proxmox can set up and run the Ceph cluster for you. Uh, for simple setups, Proxmox will do most of the heavy lifting. You'll need at least three Proxmox hosts configured in their own cluster to do this. And if you don't have three physical hosts around, you can, of course, run Proxmox inside of Proxmox and virtualize the entire setup. It'll work. I, I think performance will, make, will be so poor that it'll only be good as a proof of concept so you can see it working. But if you do have a couple of machines sitting around, it's worth playing around with. And I did personally give this a try. I have a a Dell server and I have a couple old PCs sitting around and they are filled with a bunch of mismatched consumer grade drives, just things I picked up over the years. And I wanted to take all these machines and just have one storage pool. And this is in theory is something Ceph can do. Again, it can take arbitrary sized drives sitting on different machines and turn them into one storage service with one storage pool. And inside that storage pool, it can handle replication, uh, failover, etc. I didn't think it would be able to do it, but you know what? Again, I did it through Proxmox and it worked. Um, and it was super cool to see it working. And I dropped about five terabytes of data into it, but I think it took several days for the five terabytes of data to be ingested and replicated across the nodes. And uh, I had to do a few tweaks to the cluster along the way to actually get it to a reasonable working state. And in the end, I decided it, it just wasn't worth the overhead and I felt like I'd probably spend all day uh, tweaking Ceph. And this is likely because I was running on consumer grade hardware. But again, this is a home lab and you're experimenting and learning. And it was uh, incredibly fun. Uh, and it, I learned a whole lot more about Ceph along the way. So highly recommend this as an idea for your home lab. So there you have it, five more ideas to try out. Whether you're into machine learning, containers, operating systems, storage, parallel computing. I think in these ideas, there's something here for everyone. So give one of them a try. And uh, I hope you find this interesting and you know maybe a jumping off point to try something else. If there are other ideas that you have that I haven't covered, even across these two videos, I'd love to hear about them in the comments because I'm always looking for something new to try as well. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.